All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have another Friday night together, so um, let's enjoy, let's have fun. So we're going to make, um, finish ray, uh, um, ray optics, doing straight um, trajectories. If time, we'll be starting wave optics, so we're pretty much at the end of this section. And just a reminder, we have uh, our, our quiz 1A on Wednesday, 1B on Friday, so they'll be more or less equivalent. Um, tests and they, they could test up to <coughs> the material today um, including matrices. I'd like you to try to get that under your belt um, <coughs> before things get more busy for you and uh, we'll, we'll have two simple questions generally 15 minutes each for that 30 minute quiz. All right so good luck catching up with that look at the tutorial questions everything's posted up there just jump in. Are there any questions before we begin the lecture? And if not, then what I'm going to do is go back and fix up this mistake. Um, my, my notes were actually wrong. I had made some assumption on those notes, which was a limited condition. And, and that's why I hit a quandary, because I saw something wrong and I didn't notice it before I walked in. So I've re, um, I, I fixed up the notes and um, posted these slides. So um, you could fix up what you've written there before or just download this page from, uh, it's from the, um, it's with the I section as I, I recall in Geometric Optics. So there's a single page JPEG that um, is now posted there and I've sent an email how to link to that. So let's just recap what we did here and, um, and then I'll give the correction uh, to you. Um, so we have an eyepiece lens and one of the most relaxed ways to use optical instruments is to have the eye um, uh, not accommodated, unaccommodated. That is the lens is fully relaxed and so in a normal person you will be imaging to infinity. And the neat thing is then a lens can do all the hard work for you. What it can do is it can take rays from an object, in this case set at the focal plane of the lens and these rays from the focal plane will of course be parallel and so this will look like that point is coming from infinity and so the eye relax will image that at angle alpha A and then we can compare that angle with the unaided eye and so when we take the ratio of these alpha angles um, with the lens and without then we find that just taking the object size unaided against the near point is the angle in the eye. So that would be um, at the near point without a lens. And in this situation, this angle alpha we argued was simply the same as this height displaced um, this focal length away for that angle. Alpha A is the same as that. So that ratio then divides out the Y EOs and we end up with the near point over FE. So that's for the eye aimed at infinity. What I can do now is I could strain my eye while I'm looking into an instrument. I could try to focus to the near point. And so I can increase the magnification of this system and that requires this, as I strain this eye, I am trying to see rays that are diverging from a closer position. So I can't have parallel rays here. And in the limit of straining the eye to the near point, these rays have to appear to come from the near point 25 centimeters away. So this lens has to readjust itself and that is what happens here. So in the limit of seeing the near point, there's the near point here. Here is the image that we think we are seeing. It is a lot bigger than the original object or this could be an image in a telescope or microscope. It could be a real object. And what's happened is it's moved a little bit closer, so now I am an object distance slightly smaller than Fe. And you know, when an object moves in here, it cannot focus on the other side. It creates a virtual image of diverging rays, and this must be perfectly matched to the near point of the eye. So I have this angle alpha C, which is a lot bigger than if this were not aided, and it's a little bit bigger than the one above us, the case where these are parallel rays and let's now figure that out. Um, 
I can't, how do I shift this over? Does that work? There we go, okay. So here are the geometries. So what was missing in the previous notes is I've now defined this distance L as the eye relief. It's just the lens to eye, eye distance, okay? And pretty much everything else is the same as before. All right, so now how do we figure out what the magnification is? Well, we have a relationship of this object distance to this image distance. What is the sign of the image distance? It's on the left side of the lens, so it must be negative. So 1 over SE naught plus 1 over SEI with this negative value is equal to 1 over FE. And this image distance is the near point less L. So however far you offset your eye from the lens will reduce the magnitude of SE by, by L against D near. So this could be a few millimeters or a couple centimeters, and this would be 25 centimeters in size, typically. So from this, SE is the magnitude of the near point minus the relief, L, but we force it to be negative because of the geometry. So that, is that pretty clear? Okay, so then what is the magnification of this system relative to um, the unaided eye? Well, it's, uh, it's the angle alpha C against the unaided angle. So the unaided, unaided angle is just the object size over the near point. That's as close as we can go. And here, we now take the chief ray um, through this system. This ray, all right, appears to come from this point here. That's at angle alpha C. So what I have is this apparent size of a virtual image, YEI, against this distance, which is the near point distance. So I have YEI over the near point. So basically, it's just this height against that height. And it's a positive sign because when this object's down, it appears inverted right up in the eye so that it doesn't appear upside down from the way the brain interprets our images. So we've went through that already. So now the question is how to handle that. Well, remember that we could, by relating the angle of this object or this image to the lens, those angles have similar triangles. They're identical angles. At, um, if I unfolded this to the other side, um, we showed that instead of taking the object heights, we actually talk about the magnification as the image distance away over the object distance away. And because SEI is negative, I force it to be positive because um, this doesn't do the inversion as we had seen in regular imaging. So, Converting this to this will give me the magnification power of that eyepiece lens, and the rest of this is now just algebra, paying careful attention to signs. So I take the image distance over the object distance. This ratio should be big. And what is this image distance? As we found here, it's the magnitude of that distance, so it's the near point minus the eye relief, and I have 1 over SC naught. I really want to get rid of SE naught here because I'm not so sure what distance that would be. I would adjust that, adjust that so I can make an image, but I would really like to cast it in terms of the focal length of the eyepiece lens. And so I go back to the lens maker's formula now where the power of the lens is just the inverse object and inverse image distances. What's happened is this image point is near the near point and negative and the object distance is slightly smaller than Fe. So what I do is I solve for this, which gives me 1 over Fe. So let's slip this up. It's 1 over Fe minus 1 over SEI. All right, and I've already defined SEI over here. So let's expand that out now. So we've got D near minus L here. 1 over Fe, let's leave it there, expand this to the near point minus L, and notice the sign changes because this S is negative, so now it becomes a positive contribution which improves the magnification of the system. Okay, so then this near point minus L, bring it inside, and what we get is the final result here, and it's a little more complicated, but not too much more. The magnification power then when our eye is 
accommodated to the near point is the same magnification as we had before, the near point over Fe, but with two changes. One change is that the magnification increases by one. So, for example, if I make L equals zero, if I make my eye contact the lens, then I can increase the magnification power by one. So if this were five, it's now six times more powerful. So as a user of an eyepiece lens or magnifying glass, then you can vary the magnification from D over F to plus one. That's the best improvement you can make. Now, if L increases as I move the lens away, this reduces the magnification. For example, if L becomes F, what do I get for magnifying power? Well, I get F over F, which cancels the plus one benefit. So once I go to F away, I get back the magnification as if my eye is relaxed. And if I go farther away, the magnification reduces by how much bigger L, how much L eats away from the near point. So the lesson in this is that the magnification power is approximately the near point over the eyepiece lens, but we can play with our eyes. This is just the human factor interaction that this manipulates a bit according to position, and it improves if we strain our eye, as you would expect if you make your lens of your eye more powerful, you can get an enhancement, but only a distance L within Fe away. Okay, so that was the part I had messed up yesterday. That's really the end of, of eyepiece lenses, the end of microscopes and telescopes. So I finish on that and I'm going to switch to PowerPoint here. But let's see if there's any questions and make sure you understand this material. Okay, so we now understand microscopes and telescopes. Both of them have eyepiece lenses. This is one component of their magnification. And, um, and remember that the objective lenses are quite unusual in a microscope, um, like unusually different. In a microscope, the focal length should be short, and we bring the object close for big magnification. And in a telescope, we make the focal length very long when the object is far away. And they both give big magnifications, hundreds or thousands of times, in case of the best instruments. So if there's no question on that, I will switch to PowerPoint now. Okay, so these points have been posted now for quite a few days, or these slides, and um, here we go. Okay, <clears throat> so the main part of these notes is to introduce a matrix method of calculating ray tracing, and it turns out if you look at real optical systems, there's a lot of refracting surfaces that um, would um, require or become very tedious if we applied Snell's law at every kind of interface to figure out what the rays are doing. So there's these very automated kind of approaches that have been developed and in the paraxial approximation they actually simplify um, quite dramatically and so what we're going to do is cast everything we've learned about optics so far into matrices, two by two matrices, which becomes more of an automated process where you kind of stop thinking in a way and you can then um, calculate what a curved surface will do, what a mirror surface will do, etc. And basically every optical element or process we had looked at is just four numbers, four by four matrix. All right. And so in terms of very professional programs like Code 5, ZMAX, Oslo, these do exact calculations as best as they can. They, in fact, build on these ideas, but they don't do the paraxial approximation. And in fact, they can even turn on wave theory to account for diffraction limits in, in focusing as well. So these are very sophisticated, but the ideas behind this build with this approximation here. So this isn't that hard to do. And the motivation simply is there's lens systems with too many lenses, we can follow the rays through this, and it turns out that this approach makes it more automated, easier to do lens design to tune systems, etc. All right, so one question here is where, if we're doing ray tracing, where do we find the image plane in ray tracing? 
How do we know we have an image plane? What, what did we always see happen at the image plane? We saw intersecting rays, right? So we, exactly. So we might have a source here that produces several rays. There's a source point. And then we look for places later on where if we add rays, where do they cross? And so generally, with the types of surfaces, if these are spherical surfaces and the paraxial approximation, any point source will find itself again with converging rays to some Im image point. Okay? So we're going to begin by just creating a methodology for one ray, but it's very general and applies for any rays and can also then apply to many source points automatically. So let's now learn how can we take, say, that curved surface or any part of that optical system and break it into just matrices, two by two matrices, four elements. First, though, let me define a ray. And I'm actually not following Hecht here. Hecht has a bit of an unusual notation. So actually, I just went to Wikipedia. And the Wikipedia has a, a much more uh, commonly used platform. So you don't need to read the text on this section. I think this is easy enough that you can integrate this into your mind and, and process it and, and um, learn it quite well. OK, so this is not that hard um, if you can follow. So try to learn this in real time. And basically, a ray is defined by two things. So you pick a position z. And then you look for one ray at z. And it has a displacement y. If it's above the axis, it's positive. And the other thing is, what angle does it propagate at? And the angle is measured relative to the op optical axis. So you find a parallel line here. And theta, if the ray is moving <coughs> upwards, theta is positive. If the ray is moving downwards on this plane, it is negative. Now, in a real optical system, we would also have to put in an x displacement and introduce a phi angle. So we, we've really have simplified this here. But in real ray tracing, you would consider anywhere in the xy plane any angle theta phi. And of course, these ideas can extend further um, than that. But anyway, in the end, we just have these two by two matrices to think about. So this is a ray here. And what I'm going to do, of course, what this ray is going to do is it's going to propagate. So as it propagates, it moves farther away. Y is changing, but theta is not. If I put a lens here, then the angle will change. If I put a mirror, it comes backwards. So we're going to apply all the laws we saw before and figure out how we can project this forward one ray at a time using this common matrix. So the matrix approach is really amazing because I could now shift y to here or shift angle. And those same four numbers in the matrix will exactly tell me how that ray propagates correctly. So I can put any, a family of rays, all different y's and different thetas. And it's only four numbers will transfer those rays to the new position. That's pretty amazing. Just four numbers will predict where all that family of rays will go at the next position in the optical system. So let's see how it works. OK, the mathematics is here's a transformation matrix. It's a linear transformation. And it's based on, um, in our case here, uh, um, the paraxial approximation. So we're going to make all the angles small angles, so sine theta equals theta, et cetera. The same way we did that to, for example, develop the Gaussian optic, the lens maker's formula, et cetera. So we start with y theta as this 2 by 1 matrix, the displacement and angle with the sign convention we saw. And what we're going to do is define the input one, and then go through an optical system. Could be just a curved surface. And there's two number, or four numbers in here, a, b, c, d. So we want to determine these a, b, c, d values for each situation we've seen in the course. And then this 2 by 2 matrix times a 2 by 1 will give us another 2 by 1 matrix which will spit out the new y position and the new angle. That's all this is. So we can go through a sequence of m1, m2, m3 components and change y in to y out. Then this becomes y in to y out second to third, et cetera. And this matrix method will apply to any ray into the system at any angle. OK. So the key thing is that we are using the paraxial approximation. So that has some limits. But in general, it's a first order design and good enough for us to get into optics as um, sort of min um, not full experts, but um, a starting point. 
So all tangents and sines of theta are theta in radian units. And we can use the matrix then to, for example, predict how light propagates in air or through glass. It should be a uniform media, so no bubbles or, or, or high low density regions, etc. So basically the assumptions we had before. We can find matrices if we hit a curved interface like the front, the first surface of a lens. Or we can do refraction as opposed to refraction. We can even coat curved surfaces and make curved mirrors and follow them through. And we can then add these matrices together and it's a linearly responding system all the way through. So let, let's see how it works. Let's play with this. The easiest one, let's pick air. I have an input ray, let's say one centimeter away and let's say 10 degrees rising. All right, so I want to go from Z position here at the input plane. Let's propagate 10 centimeters away for D. So where will the ray be? All right, and so this is just a high school, or even easier than high school question. All right, so what you do is you know you're going to propagate 10 centimeters, and what happens is does the ray change its path? Okay, so we have part of, half the matrix solved already. Y, theta out equals theta in. Right? So go to the matrix, theta out equals 0 times y in plus 1 times theta in. So there's our first two elements found snap like that. That's pretty trivial and easy. And what's obvious though is that y changes by tangent of theta. But in the practical approximation, tangent theta is theta. So I can write that y increases from its original value by d tangent theta or in approximation d theta in. So now you can see y depends both on its original position as well as the angle, very trivially, but you can see that the angle and y both control what y out does. And so now I've got a coefficient of 1 here for y out equals y in plus d times the angle in radian units will then tell me the output angle. So there is the first matrix, very easy to catch to predict how light propagates the distance d through this medium. Okay? Pretty easy, right? Okay. It'll get a little bit harder, but not too much. So that's the first matrix. So our goal is to find all the matrices for all the circumstances that we have done. And so here is a, a harder one. This is the Gaussian optic. Remember when we first went from medium 1 to 2? We had a radius of curvature. This is the positive orientation of radius of curvature. And if we go from slow to fast, the ray coming in here will bend by Snell's law as shown here. And what I need to figure out then is what is the matrix to describe how this ray changes to that ray at this interface in the paraxial approximation. So part of the matrix is super easy to catch. Which part is easy to catch? Yeah, y doesn't change, right? So we're just refracting from this angle at this interface to this angle here. So the easy thing is to say y out equals y in, and the matrix then describing um, this transformation is 1, 0. It's, it's the identity part. It just reproduces y out equals y in. Okay, is that clear? So what about the angle? The angle is a little harder, and we, we've already sound the, solved this with the Gaussian optic. We could even use the Gaussian optic to get these values, but I'm going to go back to first principles here and, and walk you through it. So what I need to do is figure out what, what is the output angle? Well, here's the horizontal parallel with the optical axis. So this red angle here, theta out, is the number I want. Okay? And it's relative to an input angle, so I have a rise angle of theta incident. So by this horizontal line, there's theta incident there. Okay? So theta out changes from theta incident. But notice I can't use Snell's law here, can I, on these angles? Why can't I use Snell's law? Go ahead. So th these angles are not measured to the normal. They're measured to the horizontal line. And in fact, what is the sign of these angles? This is rising, so theta incident is positive, but theta out, as drawn, must be forced to be negative because it's going downward. So in this geometry, theta out must be a negative number. 
Where is Snell's law in this equation, or in this diagram? Snell's law, I've got to find the normal to the surface, so I go to the center of this surface. There's radius r, so there's another radius. So that line there is the normal to the surface, and so I can identify the incident angle relative to that normal. And Snell's law will predict what angle on the output. There's the ray against here, the normal. Theta t then is the refracted angle inside the medium. So Snell's law then is n sine theta incident, which simplifies to this. And on the refracted side, it's n2 theta t. So theta i and theta t are not theta in and theta out. And the rest of this is just the um, geometry and trigonometry to relate out and in through that Snell's law. OK? So let's run through that. One place we'll start with is we need one more reference. I'm going to need phi in this equation. And so in the paraxial e approximation, phi is equal to this sort of arc length. It's just y out, which equals y in. But we'll start, so y out equals y in. So phi is that length over the distance away, and that is r away. So approximately in the paraxial approximation, then phi in radians is y in over r using this here. Everyone see that? Okay, so now let's dig into the angles. So I have theta out. That's what I want. I want to get theta out in terms of what parameters? I want it in terms of theta in. I want it in terms of y. And I'm allowed to put in the material properties, the system properties. So wh what are the relevant system properties? n1 goes to n2 would be one of them. What's the other one? The radius of curvature. That's all I want. I don't want more than that in the system. So I have to get rid of all the theta i, theta t's, phi's, et cetera, in this, in this calculation. OK, now that we understand where we're going then, I can look and recognize certain things. This angle phi is the same as the sum of these two angles, at least the magnitudes of those angles, right? Horizontal, horizontal, there's the bisecting line. So phi equals the sum of these. But theta out is negative, OK? So the correct way of writing this is I take phi minus theta t, and that is that angle, but I force it to be negative. You see that? So phi then is the negative, it's just simply this angle, phi minus theta t, forced to be negative. Got that? OK, next I use phi equals y in over r. Put that in there. And for theta t, I can use Snell's law. So for Snell's law, theta t here is equal to n incident, or n1 over theta, uh, times theta 1 divided by n2. So there's Snell's law converting theta um, transmitted to theta incident. OK? So I'm still not quite there yet. Um, I've got ym, which is OK, yn, sorry, which is OK in R. I've got m1 and n2, which is OK, but theta 1, or theta incident, sorry, has to be converted to theta n. So the last step here is to figure out what these angles are here. How do I figure that out? OK, so now, notice that this line here intercepts two horizontal lines that are parallel. So phi appears here. So notice that theta incident is phi plus theta n. Yeah, phi plus theta n. So I can replace um, theta 1 with phi plus theta n. So I have minus m1 over n2. This is theta um, incident. And there's phi, which I've used y n over r. And there's theta um, n, which is really the end point. I want to get things in terms of that. So there's my theta 1. And now I'm really finished the heavy trigonometry work. It's not that heavy. And I just do the math. So let's simplify and expand that. So I can combine these r terms. And I have an index difference over r divided by n2 times the displacement y. And I also have n1 over n2 times theta incident. And lo and behold, now I've completed this assessment. And I've got theta out cast in terms of a number times y in and another number times theta in. 
And so now I know the B, or sorry, the C and D terms. This is C and D in the matrix, and I've spelled it out there. Yes? Where can you visualize that theta n is y n over I'm here. This triangle? Make phi small, and then this arc length over R becomes. Oh, sorry, did you say theta n? Yeah. Oh, up here, sorry. Uh, I didn't hear you right. Um, this angle's phi. Do you see that? Um, no, what I'm asking is, how can you see that theta n is actually y n over the um, There's phi, and there's phi, right? And then if I finish drawing that, I have theta n, OK? And this is theta i. So theta i equals phi plus theta n. You got it? Is that what you need, or? OK. So, so this is phi plus theta n. And then the rest follows. OK, any other questions? OK, so let's um, analyze this a bit. This is actually um, leads to the Gaussian optic. I'm not going to drive it. I leave it as an exercise, if you like. Um, I'm going to, though, apply this for the lens makers formula later. So I'll give you an example of, of like this later. So let's look at it, though. This kind of looks like the focal power of the lens, right? One over uh, the fo one over the uh, kind of focal length of a first surface in the Gaussian optic. So remember, how much can we change the angle of a ray coming in if we make the radius smaller and the ins and the refractive index difference big? we have a very powerful refracting surface. But notice what this relationship says here, that the angle will only change a lot if I move the ray far away. So as a ray moves from the vertex higher and higher, then the power of Snell's law becomes more and more important to deviate the trajectory. Okay? So this is the focusing power of the surface what does this term here, n1 over n2, do? Well, while we're thinking of that question, why don't we consider making r infinity? What, what is r infinity? It is a flat surface, like going into a plate of glass. So what is that condition when r is infinity? What, what does that mean this angle's doing? Go ahead. So it's bending. What are we doing? We're just doing Snell's law at a flat surface, right? So actually, if I make R go to infinity, I have a whole mat I have another matrix for like going into a flat surface of say glass from n1 to n2. All right, and then I have a matrix which is one zero, zero, and not one, but a ratio, and that's the Snell's law ratio. So y won't change and theta out equals n1 over n2 theta in. That's just Snell's law against a flat surface. It's the same regardless of what y is, OK? All right, so there is a matrix then which I can now apply to any ray. I can make y positive or negative, and I can make theta positive or negative, and this will tell me exactly what the output ray will do from left side of the interface to the right side of the interface inside the praxial approximation. OK? All right, so focusing and imaging comes in here, etc. cetera. If there's any question on this? So this is one matrix. It's one of the more complicated ones. OK, mirror reflection. We'll spend a little bit less time on this. It involves some um, trigonometry again. So here's the end point. What does a mirror do? Well, we have a ray rising up here at theta incident. And what does it do? It reflects and comes backwards. So the sign conventions change here. In this case here, when, R, um, when the center is on the left, we say R is positive. So this is the only place we change our sign convention on reflection for mirrors. So before. Um, this would have been a negative radius, but in reflection, we reverse the sign convention. Okay, so that's what that says there. All right, so I have a ray that, um, well, let's remember, what, what, what happens in a mirror if I have parallel light coming in? Where does it go? Does it go to C? 
That's R away. It goes to R over 2. The focal length is R over 2. So it's half the radius away. Okay, remember that? So if you look down here, there's the focal length here, right? Focal length is um, R over 2. So that's 1 over F minus sine. And that's actually um, the same answer as a lens. I'm going to put 1 over F in here for a lens. So we'll, we'll do that later. So I have then the same situation where y out equals y in. And I have an angle change. Now there's no Snell's law. So instead of m1 over n2, there's no Snell's law. This is 1. So I, I basically start by comparing my new angle against the old angle. And then it changes according to how high or low I am by how powerfully curved the surface is. So small radius of curvature will give a big angle change. The net effect, of course, comes back to something very fundamental that the incident angle equals the reflection angle. The law of reflection plays out here. And so there we have differences again between what is measured against the normal to the surface. This, this is the radius here, and that's normal. So theta incident equals theta r, or these black colored um, arcs. And relative to ray tracing, I need to f see that I'm rising at angle theta incident, but I'm falling by theta out coming backwards. So now the ray is coming backwards and it's going down. So what should the sign of theta out be? So if I, when I was going to the right, a rising ray has positive angles. But if the ray is now going this way, if it's falling, it has a negative angle. So as drawn, theta out is negative, expect to be negative here. And that's why we have a minus sign to represent it coming down. And so that's a focusing condition as drawn here. OK, so let's crank out y out versus theta in. This is a little bit easier than the last example. So again, phi is y in over the radius of curvature. That's the same. y out equals y in. So what is theta out? So theta out needs to be somehow cast against um, theta r, theta i's, maybe using phi because we can relate that to y in and, and a feature of this um, curved mirror. So what is theta out? So theta out has to be negative. And theta out is equal to what angles? Well, this angle up here is phi, right? From horizontal, here's this line. So by symmetry, phi is here and phi is there. If I take phi plus theta r, okay, phi plus theta r, I've got theta out. Then phi is y over r, and theta r turns out to be equal to, to the incident angle, okay, by law of reflection. And then theta one, um, incident, what is that equal to? Well, here's phi again. I mean, there's probably a faster way to get this. So I take phi minus theta in. So phi minus theta in then replaces um, the theta incident. And now I can um, put for phi y over r and simplify this. So down here, I've got two y over r terms, y in. So it becomes minus 2 over r y in. And the minus and minus makes this theta positive. So basically then what a curved mirror does on reflection, a rising ray will have a reduction of the angle according to its position y times um, uh, divided by the focal length, which is um, focal length r over 2. So there is the matrix terms there. Not too hard to develop. OK? So notice, um, interestingly, if um, if y becomes negative, what happens is when the ray comes from here, it projects the ray upward. So then the sine of theta out can change. So as y changes sine, you can play with this and just see it has all the right, um, it, it drives things in the right direction as you would expect. Okay? So sine convention is important to follow. Okay. Um, I'm going to do this later. This is just another exercise to connect this with ray tracing. I've got an example coming up that um, will demonstrate that again. Okay, so any questions about the mirror?
So there's another matrix. So here are the only ones that we are important for the course. There's just the focal length. Is uh, it um, uh, no, this is on Wikipedia. So, <laughs> so, so the textbook has a different notation, so I recommend you just use this here. I, I don't think you need to go to the textbook. Is it, is it already posted? These, these slides have been posted for about a week, I think. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I've, and I've sent reminders to everyone to pull these out. So um, I, I send a lot. Do I send too much email out? Is that too noisy or, or is it helpful? You need to be hit lots of times. OK. <laughs> all right. I, I don't know quite what the right amount is. So I, all right. So, um, so follow those things. It's all there. So if, if you go to you know, the website, I'm posting any PowerPoint slides, anything projected. Um, and, but when I have Blackboard notes here, I actually list the topics so that you should be able to stay organized inserting your, these notes against the PowerPoint slides, all right? So I, I am warning you with emails that there's downloads to happen. When I say download, that means you, come, you, you download the notes and come in. And some of you have brought these in. Some of you have tablets. I think some of you are texting, so. <laughs> OK. All right. I'm not scolding you. I'm just. Uh, no, it's OK. It's my fault. <laughs> OK. All right. Um, so these are the only matrices that you need to know. So let's recap what we've learned here. There is a displacement. A, a straight ray going over distance d requires this matrix. So when d is 0, nothing happens. You're in the same place. y is the same. The angle is the same. And when d comes in, we have to have a matrix to describe the displacement. So that was the first thing we did. If we had the front of a lens, then more things can happen. There's no displacement, so y stays the same. But we have angle changes. We have Snell's law plus a curvature correction. This comes from the Gaussian optic equation of a single refracting surface, which we dealt with in the course. So this is the equivalent equation to the Gaussian optic. It does exactly the same thing. If I have a mirror, how do I get the mirror result? Well, let's look over here. Here's the curved mirror. And we just did this result on the previous slide. So how do I go from here to here? R is infinity. It goes flat. And I get the identity matrix. So what does a mirror do is it basically has a rising ray coming in. It is rising coming backwards. So theta stays the same sign, but it's now coming backwards as a mirror should do. And Y isn't displaced, is not changed. All right, makes sense. So that's the identity matrix. OK, now we talked about this one. We already derived this. How do we get this one? Where does this come from again? I know, but, um, but how, I actually solved a harder problem. So which problem? This one, right? When I make r infinity, OK, when I make r equals infinity, this turns into that. All right, so that's a simplified version of this. This is a simplified version of that. There's not that many matrices to really know. Okay, and then the last one is the lens formula. So I have some slides to talk more about the lens maker's um, correction. But you can kind of see, look, look at the parallels in here, right? That's the focal length, r over 2, the inverse of this. That's the power of focusing with the curved radius. So you can kind of guess, well, if that has focal length r over 2, then a lens should just have 1 over f in here. In fact, then these two seem similar to each other, knowing what the focal length of this curved mirror is. OK? So that's all you need to know to apply that. And I just want to spend a bit more time on this. So any questions about, th I have a few more points, but any questions so far? Let's take a break and think. What have we learned? Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I probably, I mean, it would just be reproducing what's in the notes. So that's not a very useful thing to ask. But I would expect that you should know how to derive them. I'm unlikely to test for it, OK? So, so I won't test you on it. <laughs> OK. But I, I can still ask hard questions, so don't relax. <laughs> All right. So we, we, need, we can apply these equations to figure out what rays do. What I'm going, what I want to ask you to do now, here, here's a question now. 
how can I derive this equation from information up here right now? What would I do? Go ahead. So I apply this twice for a thin lens, right? I would go into this medium and then I would change the N2s, put in a different R, invert this because I'm going back to the original medium, and I would need to figure out how to multiply this matrix of the first surface against the matrix of the second surface. And so one question is what order should I apply these matrix multiplications in? Here. So let's think about it. In this optics, let's come back, the rays hit this matrix first. So mathematically, I need to strike this matrix against the input angles, the input displacements, y and theta. Then I'm, if I had a thick lens, I would apply this matrix second. That would be the second mathematical step. And then I would apply the last surface, this flipped over, so I would exchange the ends and um, N1s and N2s and put R2 in, and I would do that as the third um, multiplication to then figure out what the output ray does. Yes? But in the case of the multiplication one, are we just assuming D? So this assumes D equals zero, but we do thick lenses at the end. Um, I don't do the, I, I do give you the answers, but that's how you get the thick thick lens formulas, yes? The first step for a thick lens is you use this matrix first, use this matrix second where D is the thickness of the lens, okay? And then third, you craft this matrix for the case of exiting the lens. So you're gonna have three matrices for a thick lens, but if I make D equals zero, I get the identity matrix, so it disappears in terms of influence and I have multiplication of two matrices. So somehow from this, I can derive that. We, we have that coming up. Yes? Uh, so what do you mean is uh, for a thin lens, is uh, D equal to zero? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's all. OK. So just a reminder, this is what we've done now. We have learned a class of, we, we've learned about different optical devices, propagation and air, curved surfaces, mirrors, refraction, etc. We have this family of ABCD values, four values for each situation, and we simply then can take any ray, displace y in, angle theta in, and calculate its output condition with just four numbers. So what we've just argued then is the order of multiplication is important. What I can do now is I can assemble a complicated optical system with lots of interfaces, lots of gaps, and the question is what is the order of the matrix multiplication? What's key is that the first surface or first device that the ray see must be the first multiplication. So an input ray is first affected by M1, the first optical component seen, then M2, M3, up to Mn. And the multiplication of matrices is backwards, obviously, then. So if I reverse the order, then matrix 1 converts y in to the second set of y ins and theta ins. M2 will convert it to the third y in, y out, etc. through the system. So it's important to remember that we must go backwards on the ordering against the ray trajectories. Okay? So that's it. That, that is almost everything and I just, just have a couple examples of um, thin lenses and then thick lenses which are harder. Okay, so let's just spell it out. Here is an, here's an application. So here is a lens, R1 and R2. R2 is negative as shown. And I al allow medium M to be air or water. Same on both sides, so it's a symmetric case. And L NL is the refractive index of the lens. So the first matrix, if we go back, we look at these, convert N1 to the medium and L N2 to the lens. And here is the first surface. This surface is M1. That's the first matrix that has to multiply. It goes on the right side. So it is equal to these values as we saw before, Snell's law and the power of that surface. And then M2, the second surface, has R2 in it. Now if as drawn, R2 has to be negative. 
right? But we write R2 this way, and when it's curved with the center on the left, we must put a negative sign in. As drawn, R1 will be positive, okay? Now notice that the ends, NLs and MNs, have changed positions, obviously, because now we're going from NL to N NM, and so we have that difference there, and there's this correction NM here. And notice Snell's law is reversed as well. So we're going from NM to NL, and then we're going from NL to NM. All right? So there are the proper matrices, so you should practice that yourself just to make sure you've got the discipline to get the ends ordered right and the signs right in this problem. So now what do I do here to get the matrix for a thin lens? So why is it a thin lens? So properly what I should be doing is to get the matrix for a, um, a lens. It's going to be equal to M1, but that's the first matrix I apply. I could then put in 1D01 for the thickness of the lens. And then I put M2 in, which is the last surface to take place. And what I do in here is I let D equal 0, so it becomes the identity matrix. And this becomes M2, M1. So that's not written here, so you should write M2, M1, and this is the result after doing M2 equals M1. So notice what happens then is Snell's law disappears here, doesn't it? The angle hasn't changed. Okay. And what is here is simply the focal length, the power of the lens, inverse focal length. We derived this already before. We took the Gaussian optic twice for a thin lens, and we ended up with this being the power of the surface. So it depends on the differences in the inverse radii, depends on the index differences, and lo and behold, we have the definition of F here. Okay? So if this becomes air and M becomes 1, and then M becomes 1, this would be the lens value. If R2 is negative, then it adds to the strength of the lens as, as a converging lens. Everything is the same as before. What happens if this becomes um, a flat plate? A plate of glass. A flat plate of glass. What happens? What's the, what's the final matrix? It's a flat plate of glass. Yes? Go ahead. So I get the identity matrix. It basically disappears because, well, I have a plate of glass, but it doesn't focus. R2 and R1 equals infinity. So that term disappears, and I have the identity matrix because it became thin. Right? So if I went back... Um, and rewrote these matrices, I would find it's not the identity matrix. I would have a displacement D, and I would have Snell's law built into it. And that could be an exercise, for, for example, for you to figure out. So when I go into a plate of glass, what happens in a plate of glass is I have this trajectory. It goes straighter, and then I have that trajectory. Whoops. Okay, so when that goes to zero thickness, then that point comes to here and we don't see any deviation. Otherwise, the deviation is different than just propagating in air. In air, this would have gone like this, right? And it actually has um, a less displacement over D. Anyway, that's a very easy one to calculate. So to calculate that one, you can use um, this matrix, this matrix, and then you apply the inverse of that, or the N1, N2 reverted matrices. All right, so how would we do that? I have to find matrix one, matrix two, and matrix three. And it's equal to, okay, this has index N1, thickness D, index N2. Okay, so what are the matrices? Should be able to do this faster than I write on the board. So what's M3? One, zero, one. What what's the ratio there? N1 over N2 or N2 over N1? No. That's going from M1 to N2. 
Matrix 3 is, oh, I did this backwards. Ah, N1, N2, I made a mistake, sorry. I'm going from 2 to 1, it's backwards, sorry. So this becomes uh, N1, so it's N2 over N1. What's the next matrix? Is that the zero? Yeah, this is zero. Uh, this is zero, yes. Okay, thank you. What's the next matrix? It's 1, D, 0, 1. Okay, and then the last matrix, 1, 0, 0, N1 over N2. So you, you can expand that out to get the result. Okay, so notice, it, you have to remember to reverse the orders because I think, I think human nature here is to follow them in the order and get it backwards. So remember, you've got to go backwards uh, from the order uh, that follows how the rays come through the system. And um, remember to keep track of when indices are changing signs. See the symmetry switch here. Yes? Um, so if I look at N2 to N1, right? If I look at this, this is backwards, so I have to make this backwards for the matrix, for that matrix. This, this, this interface is exactly this situation, right? I have N1 over N2, that's M1, so you, you're making that order mistake, right? You're making the order mistake. OK, yes? What's the purpose of doing this? Because it won't maximize anything. What? It won't magnify anything. Um, because we have plates of glass and lots of systems. I'm just showing you all the different possibilities here. So sometimes we have to have a, a window, for example, in a submarine or so. Um, we have windows in everyday life, so they have to be accounted for. And they make the optical path length longer, so they change the ray trajectory. So this is an ex just a simple example to throw up here for you. So an optical system will have flat surfaces, curved surfaces, um, different materials, different refractive index materials, so that it corrects for aberrations and makes, makes the imaging perfect. So an objective lens might have 12 lenses in it. No, yeah, it just display, it just does this displacement. But how do you calculate that? I, I, I could use high school geometry to figure this out, but now once I have this solution, I don't have to do it anymore. And then I can take any ray, any displacement. This matrix is done once. It applies to every ray, every angle in here, and will tell me what each of those rays have done over here automatically. So it becomes an automated way of calculating outcomes very quickly. This just becomes four numbers. So this, any ray here, times four numbers tells me its ray position there. Okay, so it's useful to make this an automated quick calculation for any input condition in the paraxial approximation. Okay? All right, well let's practice this uh, harder idea. Um, now, sorry, so we've done this one, excuse me. So. Um, you could work the, that out as an exercise to lead to this. It, it doesn't take very long um, to get this result. Okay, the next one, this is an example now to, to relate it back to ray tracing. So remember I asked these questions and didn't answer them, those exercises. So here is an example of an exercise where if we think of what a lens does, okay, in what we just described, we have this matrix describing a lens according to the displacement y. So at displacement y, I have theta in and theta out. And I only am focused on what happens here in a thin lens. But remember, in the bigger system, this ray traces back to, say, a point source here at this object distance. And this ray trajectory, when it crosses the axis, will form an image point here. So a ray through the optical axis will cross. That is the image point of this object. And we know that we have the lens maker's formula here. 1 over S naught plus 1 over SI is the power of the lens. So that's where we were grounded in starting geometric optics. And let's just finish the connection between these two points. Um, how does this relate to this picture here? So there's a family of rays with different y-ins, 
positive and negative, each with different theta i's, but they are all common to coming from this point here. And this matrix will change their angles and ensure that they all cross at that point si away. So, um, wait, let me get my train of thought here. So there's the background. Okay, so I'm going to use the paraxial approximation, and let's, um, yeah, okay, and let's um, now look at the input angle. So there's the input angle here by symmetry. The input angle is just the displacement of the ray yn over s naught away. Okay? Theta 2, or that should be theta out. So there's the typo here. That should be theta out. Theta out should be negative. And that's theta out in here, the magnitude. And that simply is y out over the image distance, <coughs> si but it's forced to be negative because it's coming down. Okay? Y out equals Y in. So now, let's apply the Gaussian formula for the thin lens formula. Um, it's actually called the Gaussian thin lens formula. I just call it the lens maker's formula. So if we apply this equation, substituting theta out, um, or sorry, substituting for SI, we get theta out is equal to y, so let's take that in, y in over si, negative, but y over si is 1 over f minus s naught, so I use the lens maker's formula, okay? And then y in um, can be, re the 1 over s naught, sorry, um, can be replaced with theta in over y in, okay, from here. And then bringing y m through, I now have an equation for theta out equals theta n derived from, this, from the lens maker's formula. And there's the focal length, the power of the lens. So theta out gives me minus 1 over f plus um, change, let's say, relative to the input angle. So the lens maker's formula connects, say, a source point, an image point, and a family of rays that um, can be described by this matrix method and we can bring it from here, or as I had done here, we could use the Gaussian optic results and derive the same formula as before. So these are two different ways to look at the lens. But in this particular way, we've connected the source and object through the lens maker's formula. And e each of these points, even though y in and y out, uh, y in and theta in is different, they all come from here and they all go to there. Um, and it's only those four numbers which does it all. That's really just a summary of where we've been. Okay? Okay, so um, what we could do now is, um, it's, I can't see that right. It's about eight after. We could take a break. Do you want a break? We could take a break for a few minutes and then um, digest this. And then I'll start with thick lenses. We have just another couple slides. 7.15, yeah, I went way over, sorry. Okay, so let's take a break. Um, we'll start at 7.25, all right? <laughs>